Okay, so it is 2.03 and I've been given the go ahead that we can get started. Um, so good afternoon. While this is a virtual event, we recognize and acknowledge that Ryerson is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. But our responsibility at the Ted Rogers School goes beyond a territorial land acknowledgement. As we are committed to fulfilling our obligations to this treaty and Indigenous peoples through the intentional creation and development of meaningful Indigenous initiatives, which are grounded in respect, equity and collaborative spirit. Welcome to the Ted Rogers School Indigenous Speaker Series. I'm Jessica Griffiths, the Student and Community Engagement Coordinator at the Ted Rogers School, and I'll be your host for today's panel discussion on our connection to nature and transforming our space. The Indigenous Speaker Series was created in response to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action number 92 and serves as a source of inspiration and education with the aim of sharing stories and learning between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada and globally. The series, this series of conversations with Indigenous knowledge keepers, entrepreneurs, and artists will guide a collaborative venture in developing a shared space Indigenous healing garden and the installation of Indigenous artwork at the Ted Rogers School. This speaker series is part of the exploratory phase of the Indigenous Healing Garden Initiative and will provide participants with a snapshot of what is happening in several indigenous themed urban green spaces around Toronto. I am very excited today to be joined by Isaac Crosby from Evergreen Brickworks, Eileen Thronis from Ryerson Urban Farm, and Brian Norton from Aboriginal Student Services at Ryerson U. Today's speakers bring a wealth of knowledge, passion, and experience in transforming urban jungle surroundings into indigenous themed green space. Just as a reminder um, that there will be some time for Q&A at the end of the presentations. So I ask that you hold your questions for this time or you can feel free to put them into the chat box or the Q&A box, sorry. Um, and we will answer them when we get to the Q&A uh, portion. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Isaac Crosby, to introduce himself and share some of the incredible work he's doing with Indigenous themed green space at the Evergreen Brickworks. Hello there, Anine, everybody. My name is Isaac Crosby. I come from the Ojibwa of Andredin. I have been, I'm the lead hand in urban agriculture at Evergreen Brickworks, as well as their, their Indigenous Coordinator Program Coordinator. I've been there for about four years now. And the first slide you see that says Evergreen, that's the first, my, that slide, that's the first year I started building that garden at Brickworks. The garden at Brickworks I take care of, the Indigenous themed garden, I call it the Indigenous Agricultural Techniques Garden. That came about about four years ago. I was walking by the garden with one of the execs and they asked me flat out, can you do something with this garden? And I was like, oh yes, I can. Just leave it in my hands and I'll make sure this looks really, really pretty, or really beautiful actually, and bring it back to nature. So with that, the following year, we ended up getting a, we ended up getting funding, funding for the garden, funding for the program. The funding was really for, from INAC, and it was how we could, we had to find a way to re-indigenize Evergreen Brickworks. Because unfortunately, for the longest time, the First Nations community would look at Evergreen Brickworks and they thought, they kept thinking it felt more Western European. There was no representation there for them. Then I come in with a great team that, that was already there, actually. We started working together. We got this funding and we just started building programs. So we ended up doing, um, our programs were, were centered around food, medicine, and ceremony. So three-year funding from the government to build food, medicine, and ceremony. So my first thing was to build that garden bed. My first, my first garden in that, in the first gardens, I'm probably garden plants, I should say, are sunflowers. Because the first thing you have to do is get the soil back to health. So you probably see a picture of me in a, sunfl in a sunflower field with all the big sunflowers behind me. Right there, that's it right there. So I had a lot of sunflowers. So sunflowers for us back home, we, everyone knows about the three sisters but we also do three more versions of the three sisters. So of course there's corn, beans, and squash. Back home, what we do, if we think our soil is contaminated, we do sunflowers, beans, and squash, because sunflowers will help clean your soil. 
if our soil is too compact, we do sunroot beans and squash. Because sunroot, most people know it as Jerusalem artichoke. Um, it's not, not from Jerusalem, not an artichoke, it's actually from here, part of the sunflower family. What she will do is that she will, she will uncompact your soil. But be aware of her because she will take over your whole garden bed. So we've been doing that for about, the, this is actually the last year for INAC. So the garden beds that I take care of there are also run by Indigenous youth. So I also work with the Wandering Spirit School. And this past summer, actually in, in the last two weeks of it, I'm actually working with seven, I'm mentoring seven Indigenous youth on urban farming and how to do traditional urban farming while in the urban setting. And we're having a lot of fun. I mean, the, the space I created down there is, it's a beautiful space. I mean, I took a space and created it into a place, but created it into a place where First Nations people can come down and feel more relaxed at work works. And now that we've done that, I mean, we had, the last year we had Ojibwe cans every Sunday. And once that happened every Sunday, we had, I had a lot of adults who didn't want to do the language classes who started gardening with me. So this garden created a, created a indigenous earth workers group. So even we get together every single Sunday and we, we, we earthwork, take care of the garden beds. We do traditional stuff, non-traditional stuff. We talk about the, the traditional healings of certain plants. Um, how, how can we plant them traditionally and harvest them traditionally? So the space that created into this place is creating such positive, positive energy across the city. I hear more and more people talk about this space and more and more people coming down just to view it. And that's what I wanted. I especially wanted, especially wanted the First Nations student youth to be able to come down to Brickworks and just, just be and just enjoy themselves and have a chance to, to learn some traditional techniques. I don't just keep it to for First Nations people, I do it for everyone. So everyone across the board is allowed to come down and work with me. Um, just know that when you work with me, you really work with me because I will get you dirty. But you'll have a lot of fun. We're, we're also created within that space. So you saw the teepee that was behind one of the pictures. So the teepee came about with Council Fire. Um, we also have a sweat lodge on site, which is behind the teepee. So we do sweats once a month as well. So that whole area where the Indigenous Agricultural Techniques Garden is, the other name is also called Thrive Garden, but I call it the Indigenous Agricultural Techniques Garden because that's what it was in the beginning. But the whole area has an amazing energy. And in that area, this is where I always meet all the elders, the First Nations youth, for some other reason they are called to that area. And whenever they're called there, I'm always in the garden. They talk and they talk with them and see how they're doing and give them a nice tour of the garden. Because what I my, what I love to have people do is come down and actually see the garden, be one with the garden and, and do a tour. Do, do a tour and see, see what I have growing in there. You'll also find at the back of the garden, I also have bee, that's like four beehives as well. So we're also doing beehives. I have the, the indigenous youth creating their own bee boxes that they will prime and paint and do whatever they would, any creative, any creative thing they want to do for the, for the beehives. It's a lot of fun. It's great to see, it's great to see the community come down to Brickworks. It's great to see everyone come down to Brickworks and utilize what we have down there. It's such a beautiful site. Um, we not only just have the, the indigenous agricultural techniques gardens, we also have four medicine gardens on site as well. And the medicine gardens are taken care of by the youth. Our medicines are spread out throughout the community. Uh, they are free of charge because I found out that people were buying medicines and for me, that's a big no-no. So when people get a hold of me and tell them, come down, let's check out the medicine garden and you, you take what you need. Um, we have one of the medicine gardens that's actually in a canoe, which is kind of cool. Uh, just, just to keep it kind of a water theme, you know, being at Brickworks, being a valley. So sort of had some, some, water, some water sites as well, some water plants. One great thing I did last year, but this year did not work well because of COVID. Last year, I actually planted wild rice. So what I did was had wild rice in a container just to show the First Nation youth that because of what's going on within our climate, that we may have to start thinking of different ways to take care of our food sources. And so I figured, let's do wild rice inside of containers. And it actually worked. And then we, then we planted even more rice, different kind of rice as well. So one thing is you, you probably realize that I like to take chances at Brickworks and just kind of push the envelope when it comes to gardening, I push the envelopes when it comes to traditional foods, and just, just get people back to our, our source. Last year I had a pawpaw festival, pawpaw tasting festival on site. I invited the First Nations youth and community down to try pawpaw fruit because I realized that a lot of people in the community have not tried pawpaw. I grew up on pawpaw fruit from down in southwestern Ontario. So to me, it was I knew about it. I knew the taste. But the people in the city did not. So we had the pawpaw tasting festival. 
they tried every they tried to pop paw and their eyes got so big and i was like yes this is what i want you to, to taste and to experience experience this fruit that comes from our, our traditional fruit um and we need to get this plant back back in circulation so now more and more people who are in different reserves are looking at growing pawpaw paw trees on the reserves uh brickworks we have seven pawpaw paw trees on site um, i'm pushing for more there's the beautiful fruit first nations fruit and I'm still trying to find out the original word. I know Papa is not the original name of it. Papa comes from the Spaniards, but I'm going to find the original name so we can have at least at least some sort of signage up for individuals to see what it's about. One thing about gardens, and you're doing indigenous gardens, make sure you have some sort of signage. Have it in the original language, English and French, if you can. But make sure you have this, the signage so people know what's there. So when people see the see certain names to certain food, maybe they'll see it again and it'll, it'll, it'll trigger their memory. Because one thing I'm pushing for this year is having more signs in the garden, not big signs, but more signs that will have the First Nations language on them. So people actually start seeing and get used to it and get accustomed to it. Because we need, we need to have that within our food systems. Um, we have a lot more to come with at Brickworks. I, I personally enjoy, I enjoy what I do. I love where I work. I love all the outreach I do and meeting people. And just have people come to the garden and just 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 talk and watch how they're just watch how they 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 become one in the garden and they they really look at it like wow i can't believe this is in the middle of toronto and i go yep every once in a while you got to come you got to go into a forest and see a farm or field um some gardens in a forest and br every brickworks were forests all around why not i mean thousands of years ago i bet you any money they were far they're farming there as well but it's just great to re return it i mean not just, not just when we're farming, we're just farming for, for the three sisters. I mean, the garden's there. I go across the board, like potatoes, sweet potatoes, cucumber melons, tomatoes, you name it, especially if, it's, if it has originated from, from, from the Americas, I do my best to grow it in the garden. Because all of that is teaching, teaching moments for people who are indigenous and non-indigenous. Because I find that a lot of people don't know where the food actually originated from. And when I found out that a lot of food originated from, from the Americas, a lot of my programs will be focused on that. So I can tell people, you know, tomatoes actually didn't come from, from Europe, they actually came from, from, from the Americas. A certain strawberry was more abundant over here. Concord grapes came from over here. Chocolate, vanilla, a lot of stuff that we take for granted, that we think come from other countries, actually started from here. So one of my pushes is to make sure the indigenous youth know what food source, know their traditional foods, and let them know that the people of the, the, of the Americas fed the world. The people of the Americas show different gardening techniques. And so I do my best at Brickworks to show different gardening techniques. And speaking about different gardening techniques, one thing I'd love to do, and I still haven't got permission to do it just yet, I probably will, hopefully, um, is to do chinapas, which are the Aztec or Mayan floating gardens that they had in their ponds, and they're, they're gardening at the top of that. I think that'd be really, really cool to see within, within Brickworks, maybe down at Cherry Beach. At Ryerson, I would love to see you guys have way, a lot of in, in, indigenous agricultural techniques, a lot of indigenous plants, and have a medicine garden that is out of this world. It can be done. It can, can be done. I'd love to see more and more, more and more indigenous gardens throughout the city, every park, every school. So we always have a connection. We always have a way to, to have the students connect back to indigenous folks and learn more about us. So we can learn more about you. And who, who doesn't like food? Who does not like food? Who doesn't like to talk over food? I know I do. It's a lot of fun. Because I realize when you talk over food, even gardening, it puts people at ease and they open up even more. And I'd love to have them open up more and hear, hear the thoughts on gardening, on where they think food's going, stuff like that. Or just, just to hear the thoughts about indigenous folks. It's great. I enjoy having people open up, especially in the garden, especially when they're watering. <laughs> so for me at Brickworks, I think I have a few more years there to do some wonderful work, to incorporate more indigenous traditions, agricultural techniques into what we do there. Um, and just make sure that we have an open, open hand, open arm policy there so that everyone can come down and feel free to walk the grounds there and not feel like they shouldn't be there. And so everyone come down and enjoy the indigenous gardens that we have on site and maybe learn a thing or two or maybe teach a thing or two right but my big my big push for me for this for my indigenous garden because you'll see the teepee back there what i want back there now is a wigwam 
let's keep it to keep it to what to the local people in the area and i want more and more ojibwa squashes in my garden next year more and more shawnee squashes i'm gonna this year is my year to go out there and see what i can and cannot find to plant in a garden next year so hopefully i can have a serious indigenous garden with indigenous plants from from across the americas and maybe even maybe even taller corn so here there's taller corn in peru let's see if i can find that one i heard the corn's like 14 feet tall that would be very very interesting to grow at brickworks but lots to come lots and lots more to come um all i know is this having a garden like this having an indigenous garden like this at schools in parks at works it's beneficial for everybody it's beneficial for everyone across the board because it's a talking point and it's a chance for everyone to understand and get to know more and more first nations history within the context of canada and how we are there's we're all different nations we all have different ways of gardening we all don't garden the same because i know back in southwest ontario i do different things i grew up on different things than people up here and so what I do is I try to showcase down there, showcase up here what we do down there. And so far it's working. So far people are enjoying it as much as I am teaching it and being outside in the sun. Okay, I won't take up any much more time for you guys. I feel like I've been speaking for a long time, <laughs> but I love it. I love talking about gardening. I love talking about, about plants. I love talking about indigenous culture. And, and we're enjoying things. listening to you. I'm, <laughs> like, this, I'm in awe of the, all of the different things happening in that space. <laughs> oh my goodness. It really sounds too, Isaac, like the, um, that space is really built upon community and learning and the teachings of like the techniques and the agriculture. Yes. Um, it seems to be a huge component of the space there and the programming um, of what you're doing. Um, it's just incredible. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank you. much. Thank you. Um, so now we will move on to, we've got Arlene Thronis and Brian Norton from Ryerson Urban Farms and Ryerson Aboriginal Student Services who are going to share with us what they are doing in the urban green spaces uh, right on Ryerson's campus. Um, so Brian and Arlene, I will leave it up to you. Hi everyone. Hi, um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I'll just introduce myself again to those people who have, who don't know who I am. I am the program coordinator for Ryerson Aboriginal Student Services. I've been with Ryerson now for just over three years. Um, and um, my background, my academic background comes from uh, a little bit of in mechanical engineering and I also have a degree in environmental studies which focused around um, policy, environmental policy, um, which um, has worked for me somewhat in the past, but I found that my trajectory had, had really shifted in the past few years when I came to Ryerson. Um, so I was there for about a year and a half before um, Arlene had approached me talking and wanted to inquire whether or not um, RASP would be interested in some, uh, in some grown tobacco. Um, I think this was fairly late in the summer, like I believe like late August or something like that. Um, you know, so the growing season had pretty much already stopped, but at that time we thought it was, would be a great idea. I had no idea, first of all, that there was a a um an urban farm on top of the engineering building which i i was just totally flabbergasted when i heard that i was like okay great i've got to see this um so when arlene and i finally met she took me up there and um, you know we looked around it's much bigger than i thought it was um so then i became excited for for you know the potential for the urban garden and what it would mean for um growing um indigenous medicines and food up there and, and what that could potentially look like in the future. Um, so that was back in 2018, I believe. Um, and then last year we uh, got together and we, one of our peer support students actually um, took some time to volunteer with Arlene and her team up there to grow some traditional tobacco. Um, we, got, we got the seeds, I believe, from Six Nations. I can't remember where Arlene offhand, but um, so that sort of started a, a, a larger conversation on how we wanted to incorporate, um, um, you know, the four sacred medicines as well as other 
medicines. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the frame of mind that everything that grows is a medicine in one form or another, whether it's um, blueberries, blackberries, mm -hmm. um, shrubs, um, cedar, sage, all, all of the dandelions. Um, yeah, that's a great photo there. Um, so, you know, I, I, when we start talking about this and how do we do this and how can the indigenous community get involved? Um, you know, I, I want, I really want the students to be included in this. And so I asked one of our peer support workers, um, who would, who would want to be, um, who would want to participate. So we had one particular peer student, um, who was really keen and eager to learn because she really didn't have much of a background in, in or knowledge in indigenous, indigenous plants and medicine. Um, but with her working there, she started to gain all this knowledge that she, that she was previously unaware of and has become uh, really involved in the process. Um, I believe she graduated this year, but I, she may or may not come back to be a part of our um, Ryerson Urban Farm uh, working group um, um, in the near future. Um, but again, uh, yeah, the, the, if you've never been to the roof, I highly recommend that you go. I think there are a little bit of tours, Arlene, but because it's a rooftop, I don't think there's a lot that can go on right there, right, right at the moment. Um, but anyway, um, just uh, enough said for me for now. Um, we'll get back to that and I'll just turn it over to Arlene. Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks so much for having me and it's really exciting to be part of this discussion and um, it's always wonderful to hear um, what's going on at Evergreen Brickworks from Isaac and, uh, and to chat with Ryan and Jessica. Um, yeah, we've all been connecting about ideas for a while now and um, it's so yeah, it's fun to be able to, to start to move forward on some of our plans. And um, yeah, the urban farm has been closed for a couple of years so that we could rebuild our fences. You can see in this photo, actually, the fences are temporary. So we actually put in more permanent fences um, and some other safety. Um, we upgraded some other safety features on the farm so that we can better host. And uh, we were planning to be open for this spring, but um, with the pandemic, it pushed back the construction end date. So they're, they're still doing some finishing touches on all of that um accessibility stuff and then we also were planning to get the new actually in this photo as well you can see there's this big white building behind the farm so on the eighth floor of that building there's a brand new rooftop farm which was built as part of the green roof bylaw for the city of toronto so um this brand new ryerson building had to have a green roof and the university said uh the 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 um facilities team said why not make it a farm that seems to be going well. So uh, we were also planning to have that space be open this spring, but again, there was delays. So um, we should have both spaces this fall. And we, so we wanna get, uh, Brian has started this working group so that we can start engaging the community in working together on a design um, to include more indigenous um, agricultural techniques and, food, medicine, people, um, insects, birds, bees, butterflies, everything. So, so we're really excited and we're not gonna rush the process because of course things are moving a little more slowly now, a lot, a lot of stuff's online. And uh, I think we're all, we're all maybe moving a bit more slowly. And um, so I think we can just enjoy the process and enjoy um, the, the being able to communicate about what, what we want to see happen and and hopefully by the time it's natural to start congregating and gathering in, in these spaces again we will have a design and um and a plan so that we can get growing together so i think that's all i had to say from my end brian did you have anything else you wanted to add before we uh, move along yeah, sure. I, I, yeah, please do. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, oh, there's the thousand year old tobacco. Great, I forgot about that picture. Um, so one of our students um, who was working there last year um, had worked with the team to, I guess, specifically work with, around tobacco and 
um, and some of the knowledge that goes in with it, such as the planting and the stories around it uh, and, and the harvesting. There's, there's, when we look at, uh, you know, planting, cultivation, harvesting for um, our Indigenous medicines, there are stories that are associated with that, teachings um, that, that come, that have come through us through, you know, through many generations of, of planting and harvesting. Um, and those are something that I think once we start getting back into the uh, Ryerson River Farms, what eventually I would like to see is to be able to uh, have, a, you know, small groups of people come up and we can talk about some of these teachings and stories and, and get people, you know, really, you know, really thinking about where this comes from and where our stories come from and how it helps us to, uh, you know, have respect for the plants and the whole um, system, they hope, you know, from, from uh, you know, planting to growing and harvesting, finally the harvesting and, and use of our medicines. Um, so that's one of the things that we would like to see is, is basically this would be an opportunity for an outdoor class type kind of thing that we could eventually do. And with the second uh, rooftop garden above the Daphne Cockwell, on the Daphne Cockwell bed open, um, we would like to sort of maybe expand on that a little bit more in future years. I mean, and also uh, it's, it'd be really a great opportunity. I mean, Ryerson is, has such small green space at the moment that it makes it very challenging for us to find ways to plant, um, you know, find safe spaces for, or to, to, to plant. And obviously the TRSM building uh, would be a great place as well. Um, uh, the only concerns I have is because their rooftops, not, they're not accessible to the larger community um, at, the, at, the give, at the moment. Um, but I think when we focus on, on creating like a more comprehensive kind of um, en engagement and, and ways of um, maybe doing tours, something that, that, that could be potentially be another um, outdoor learning, um, you know, where, you know, hands-on learning is always a great, is probably the best way to learn and people can actually touch and feel the plants and smell them. Mm -hmm. And that gives them a really sense, a real strong sense of, of, you know, relationship to that plant, which is, I think, what we, what we all strive to do um, is to create better relationships, especially not just with each other, but we also have to create it with the world around us. And those includes the, that includes the plants and the medicines and the whole process of planting and gardening and um, taking care of those plants. Um, so um, we, with that in mind, um, this, uh, an idea had come out, had come about for, for over the past few months and most recently um, during um, Ryerson Indigenous Week is to, uh, you know, compile a group of people who wanted to look at, uh, you know, uh, incorporating indigenous plants and medicines on campus. Um, so we start, we, uh, I sent out a, a invite to a small group of people to start a, a you know, exploratory session discussion around uh, what can we do on campus? Um, and, um, you know, who would be the stakeholders we would be working with? Arlene and the urban farms are one, the TRSM uh, crew are another. Um, and, and we want, and I, it's, it's, it's the idea that we want to get together and create a, an ongoing discussion of how we can find, look at creative, constructive ways to, um, have, to really actively use the green space around campus. Um, whether that, whether that's actually planting on, uh, at street level or not. Uh, we're also looking at doing virtual workshops similar to this, where there would be teaching workshops. Um, you know, we could bring in different um, people um, to talk about their experiences with urban gardening or, or who focus on specific medicines and stuff like that. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's my hope that this will be an ongoing kind of collaboration throughout the next, you know, at, an ongoing thing. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's really great that we can do this now because um, we're at home and so we're also forced to think more creatively about how we're doing things. What, what do we want to do? And so, uh, you know, we, as Arlene said, we're, it's, it, we're, we're taking the time to actually think and have a really, um, you, you know, in-depth conversations about where we want to see the green space at Ryerson going from here. Um, I would eventually like to see more green space, obviously, uh, maybe some raised gardens and, and uh, 
in the um, in the quad um, rather than planting at street level. I, I don't know, um, but that could be something that could be looked at in the, in the future. Um, you know, Ryerson right now itself, it's undergoing a major, a major renovation along uh, Gold Street and Victoria or, um, um, yeah, so I don't know if any of you have been there in recent, uh, in the recent weeks, but it, it, it's coming along very, very nicely. And there's a lot of other plants that are there. I, I did not stop to see which kind, of, which kind of plants that they planted. Hopefully they're not just aesthetic plants and can actually be used, harvest, because um, that would be great. Um, I, would, uh, I would absolutely love to see some wild sweetgrass growing around there too, so you get that smell of it every once in a while. Um, but yeah, I, I think the conversations we are having now are just starting and we are looking forward to like doing more and, and creating a, a, you know, basically a, 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 an opportunity for outdoor learning. Um, so with that being said, I am going to turn it back over to whoever else. I, I don't know um, if Arlene wants to add on that, anything more or um, how about talking about the uh, fruit and vegetables or the vegetables that you grew last year? Those were pretty big. Um. At the farm? Yeah, yeah. So we, we grow, we can pretty much grow anything on the roof. So there's nothing we've found that we couldn't grow. We've grown um, corn and potatoes and tomatoes and sunflowers and um, zucchini, squash, carrots, beets. Like, so it's, I think because the, the soil that we got was put there in 2004. It was built originally as a green roof um, that was meant to be ornamental. It was planted with daylilies and more than 30 species of weeds, um, ruderal species of plants came and established themselves on the farm and thrived there for 10 years before we converted it to a farm. So when we converted it, there was all this plant, like plants growing and dying every year and lots of biomass and organic matter and very healthy soil food web and um, the plants just grow they want and you can see in this photo it's a very organic base soil whereas um, now you know 14 years later green roofs are being made with a much rockier more aggregate based soil which is what we've got on the new farm so we're going to have to amend it so that's going to be a big our big first challenge so that when we do get that design together, we, when we plant stuff, it grows. But yeah, on the, on the current farm, like it's really showing that um, all the life in the soil, it seems to be the most, you know, the, the most wonderful part about that space is that it is, it is already alive, it is fertile. And um, so yeah, so it, it really shows the potential of what rooftop farms can be and rooftop growing spaces can be. Um, and it's exciting that we've got, we've got a new space that we're reopening the current space with fences so we can get people back up there. And I love everything Brian said about outdoor learning and um, Evergreen Brickworks sounds like such an accessible space where people can just walk through and that we could maybe create that feeling on the roof as well for people to come and enjoy and participate and um yeah being like like as you said brian there's not a lot of growing space on campus and it's it's a really special thing to be able to interact with plants in this way right on campus it really does feel like a like you're outside of the city it feel even though it's on a roof which is very strange it feels really natural and wonderful to be up there and and there's yeah birds and it's nice and cool and there's all kinds of interesting insects and lots to look at there's still more than 30 species of wild plants that grow up there so there's so, so much to look at and um it's the best it's as you said it's learning by doing it's the best way to learn is is just to absorb it and be part of it uh you don't even know that you're learning and and um yeah just when when we before we were doing our construction on our fences, we did have a lot of um, volunteering opportunities and programs, and um, we had students and staff and community members who would come and sign up. And they, no matter how busy they were, whether they had an exam coming up or what you know whether it was staff and they're going through admissions or something, they they would always show up because they said this is actually what they needed to get through a stressful time was they needed to spend three hours in the farm because our shifts I think we were doing like 
you could you come and you harvest for three hours and then you leave with a bag of food so uh so people were like oh yeah no i'm i'm showing up for this this shift and um and that's that's wonderful to see yeah that it's it can be a really yeah healing space um so yeah thank you so much marlene and brian it's amazing to know that this robust farm is on a rooftop and campus and another one's coming um and just that this important work is being done um so thank you so much for sharing. Um, now we're going to, I'm just going to share a little bit about the Ted Rogers courtyard space um, and what has been happening and what currently is happening. So since 2017, I've been operating the Ted Rogers urban garden in the courtyard um, using the largely underutilized space to run a small food security garden with the produce harvested being uh, distributed to the good food center on campus and amongst my dedicate my crew of dedicated volunteers. Um, so the garden has grown from a handful of homemade self-watering containers. Shout out to Arlene and the Urban Farm. Um, you guys helped us do that. We did a workshop three years ago. Um, and from that, uh, we've grown to over 160 plus square feet of raised garden beds um, where we grow herbs and vegetables. I've got zucchini, carrots, peppers, radishes, lettuce. Um, and last year I grew over 60 pounds of tomatoes um, in one season alone. Uh, the space is incredibly hot and dry. Um, so touching on what all, what all three of you have said is this has been a real journey of learning what will grow, what will not grow. Um, and I've had great luck with tomatoes. <laughs> so that's been by far our hardiest crop to date. Um, and also this about taking chances and just trying new things. Um, I never knew what was going to grow in there really three years ago. Um, and now I'm finding out all sorts of different um, the capabilities of the garden space. Um, so having the three of you here today to share your expertise and insights uh, with what you've done in your, the urban green spaces you work in is a total delight for me. Um, so what's next for the courtyard space? As I mentioned earlier, the project is just in the exploratory phases of the process uh, with many questions remaining. So including what could this space potentially look like? What would programming in an indigenous themed green space look like? And how do you create a collaborative space for multiple communities to use? Um, you've all touched on it. We want to ensure that anyone using the court courtyard, <coughs> excuse me, feels, co uh, feels comfortable and welcome in the space that's been curated. So now that brings us to the Q&A part of this session. Um, again, I believe you can put your, ask your questions in the Q&A button um, that you'll see in your Zoom um, window. And I, we will do our best to get as many questions in as possible. So I'm gonna kick it off with the first question um, for the panelists. And any one of you can answer, all of you can answer. Given your designated projects and initiatives and the spaces that you work in, how have you incorporated indigenous ways of knowing into the creation and the design of your spaces? Okay, I'll take a stab. All right, so <clears throat> I incorporate it because that's how I grew up. I grew up on a farm with indigenous farmers. And that's basically what I knew until about eight years ago. When I turned 40, I went back to school. I studied at Humber for, for a year or two. I learned what I had to learn at Humber. Um, so I, I make sure everything I do when it comes to my gardens comes from indigenous knowing and traditions. Down to, down from getting my, soaking my seeds with May apple root, so the birds don't eat my seeds, to my clay pot irrigation, to make sure my plants are healthy all winter, all summer long, to, to using tomato leaves and tobacco leaves for insecticide. So everything I do is connected to my indigenous upbringing. Thank That's you. it for me. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs> um, Arlene, Ryan, anything to add? What was that? Yeah, my, my, training, my training was in permaculture and ecological um, farming, which permaculture is, is um, a uh, an ecological framework of farming that was based on um, 
on a study, an observation of nature and study of, an in, of indigenous growing techniques. Um, so looking at how the interconnectedness of things and um, uh, understanding that the, you know, the garden is, is, um, is like a, a system that supports, you know, like we don't use pesticides and herbicides and we don't use chemicals or synthetic fertilizers because uh, we want to feed the soil, feed the plants, feed ourselves and farms can grow more than just food, right? So we want our farm to be producing, um, to, to be, you know, part of the ecosystem that surrounds us and supporting the ecosystem and um, fed by the ecosystem. So I guess that's, that's one way in which we have approached the design of the roof is that even though it is an urban it is an it is urban infrastructure, which is so strange, <laughs> but it is hopefully bringing us back to a sense of living within within nature and the earth, and that we are that that yeah that is we are a part of that, and that is a part of us. So, thank you. Um, next question: Can you share with us some of the ways? Oh no, sorry. Yes, sorry, that is it. Can you share with us some of the ways in which you've incorporated the community voices throughout the process in shaping these green spaces? So how have you reached out? How have you made sure that the different communities that would be using these spaces feel included in, um, I guess, the design and creation um, of these spaces? Okay. Do, 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 do. Want to go first again? Sure. <laughs> okay. I'm on it. Uh, Go so for it. <laughs> what we did, what I will, I made sure that with my, within my volunteers, when, when we got the funding for a certain for gardens, I had my main idea to make, make sure it had the indigenous connection, but I also had my volunteers add their ideas to it. And some of my volunteers are not indigenous. Right. So I wanted, I wanted to make sure everyone felt welcomed in the space and everyone had some sort of, some sort of buy-in with the space, I guess you can, you can call it, some sort of connection. So there's parts, there's parts of the, 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 the indigenous agricultural garden where I, there's, I have my indigenous part, then you walk over a little bit more, and I have the European part. Right. So I have it all mixed in together. So you can see the different ways of growing, growing things. The indigenous part looks more like a forest, which means it's hard for people to get inside and get the food. Whereas the European one, everything's in rows, which means that everyone can come and take the food from you. So I just make sure I, make sure I, make, I, I incorporate everyone. Like I said, like before, next year when I do the push the envelope, I want to have more Asian vegetables growing in certain parts. I want to incorporate and make sure everyone has a chance to come down and say, hey, they grow that food in my, in my country. I'm like, perfect. Now come back and show me how to cook it. That's great. Um, Arlene, Brian, how, do, how have you, I guess, especially moving forward with the new garden on, I think it's on the rooftop of home. Um, how do you include the community that will be using the space in uh, the design process? Well, we, we had a round table in February where I was so lucky to sit with Brian and Isaac. Oh, awesome. Um, I was like, how did I get at this table? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we actually, we had Isaac speak um, at the event, which was all about, you know, what can, how can green infrastructure go beyond, you know, green infrastructure is so important. I mean, the TRSM courtyard is so hot, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's it's down, it's on the eighth floor, is it? On the seventh, and it's got about two floor, other floors then of glass around it. So it's kind of a, it's a fishbowl essentially. And above it, yeah. Um, so it's like, it's yeah. above the ground, but it's also below the roof quite a bit. Yes. So it's it's like when, when birds and insects do come in, it's it's like, you found it, yay. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, I think it is, it, it can be a challenge, right? And it's, you can feel how hot it is in there and it's like, it's great to have the green infrastructure to help cool it down and catch the water and give a place for um, wildlife to land and, and for the humans to enjoy the space of, of the building. Um, Cause I think we like a lot of the same things the wildlife like, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the wildlife is attracted to it for the same reasons we are maybe. Totally. But um, maybe we're wild too, but, uh, but yeah, right. Um, yeah. And I think, and when we think of urban agriculture, a lot of the stuff I'm seeing in the news is like plastic, you know, 
vertical plastic towers where you add this synthetic fertilizer that's also made of essentially plastic and um, and drones to localize pest outbreaks and and this so yeah it's like how can we bring how can we sort of understand the potential of urban agriculture the potential potential of green infrastructure so we we asked Isaac to come and speak because um, the garden that you grow there Isaac is a fantastic example of bringing in all these things and uh, and yes yeah, so, and we're working with Brian because that's like the working group that Brian is putting together which I see someone in the question has asked how to join so we'll have to figure <laughs> out we haven't actually met yet we're having our first meeting next week so we'll have to figure out how to engage or this week tomorrow tomorrow <laughs> yay I can't wait oh my gosh I'm so much looking forward to <laughs> um yeah so so yeah the 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 round table was one way um uh, we do surveys when we have programs we always send out surveys and we ask people um when when they come to the roof what what sort of stuff they'd like to see we talk to professors and we we go to conferences and we go to other people's gardens and uh and and we're we ha we're starting a working group so we have not designed the new farm yet like that's that's what we want to do together and unfortunately the design the the actual infrastructural design was a very quick process because we were not it was an afterthought that the green roof be a farm so we had to just quickly send them some specs of for the soil and you know so we ended up with so we had a, a a number of professors across disciplines who participated in that uh in that design um but we we kind of just quickly came up with okay there's a pad for a greenhouse there's an indoor post-harvest space a tool shed there is um um a large growing area and then there's also a gathering space with covering um for 140 people so Everybody's invited. Woo! Wow. <laughs> um, awesome. So yeah, so I think I think the question of how to engage the community is something we're still doing. So if anybody has any ideas, like please reach out. And what, Brian, what did I did I um, express all that accurately? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, pr again, prior prior to us. Connecting. I had no idea there was a green roof on the engineering building. Um, so sometimes it just takes like uh, you, you have to do an active search of who do you think the stakeholders would be. Um, and so that when Arlene and I uh, met and, and started discussing, we realized also that it's actually quite imperative that the students be involved. I mean, this is a learning institution. The students should always be front and center of our thoughts for what we want to do. So that's how we um, approach a lot of our projects is what is the student engagement like? What what would the students like to see? And um, when we, and, and we need to take those into considerations. Ultimately, the students, uh, you know, are our guiding principles for developing stuff like this and making sure that it is um, ongoing and long lasting. So, um, you know, that's one of the things that from my perspective is that we always um, make consideration for what is the student feedback going to be like? What is the student involvement going to be like? And who is going to be involved? Um, mm -hmm. That's one way that we consider at RAS our student engagement is always, students are always often, more often, oftentimes the front and center of our considerations. So, yeah. I'm so glad that you said that, Brian, because I think that's so key. Um, that you know that it's student centered, right? They're such a they're the biggest stakeholder that we have as a post secondary institution. Um, so so that was, that's awesome to hear. Um, it sounds like all of these garden spaces are built on built upon community um, and collaboration. Um, I'm mindful of time. I'm going to ask one more question from the chat, and it is going to be so. What are, what are some, or what is one, I'll say, of the biggest challenges you face with shared garden spaces? <laughs> <laughs> with competing interests. <laughs> <laughs> I would, <Okay. laughs> anyone wanna tackle that? My, my, whoo. Mine is, when, when people come in from, from off the street and decide they want to go grocery shopping in the garden. That's, what, that's my biggest struggle. It's always been the biggest struggle for the past four years. 
Okay. That because because there's no no fences per se in the gardens and no locks because that's the way I like it. Uh, people can come by, you know, almost any time and just kind of take the fruits and veggies as they need it. I caught one family. I actually caught one family one year, and I was like, uh, "What are you doing?" They're like, "Oh, we're picking some veggies." I was like, "So, uh, did you not go grocery shopping today? This is actually a teaching garden for these youth," and they they got they're embarrassed. And I said, "Well, here's the thing. Apparently, you need this food." I get it, everyone's hungry. So this is what you're gonna do for me. I have four pails of water over there that these, this garden needs. So when you're done picking your veggies, I need you to water my garden for me. And they did it. That's, so that's my big, <laughs> my biggest problem is the two leggeds. Anything else, four leggeds, fine. You'll eat what you want. The insects, you're fine. The winged ones, you're fine. But when the two leggeds come around, I'm like, oh no, my produce is gonna be gone. <laughs> Your whole harvest disappears. <laughs> gone. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> no, that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, because I'm on, the, I'm on, the, I'm, I'm not on the rooftop. I'm on the ground, no. the ground floor. Right. And people, people come and just start picking, and I'm like, okay. But when I catch you, you're going to be doing some work. You can take if you work. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Um, <laughs> Arlene, what about with you guys? I know that up on the, um, I know that you guys do some tours and stuff. Um, but what are, what are some of the big challenges that um, you guys have faced with your space? With, with sort of as a, like as a community space like yes yeah like what would be one of your bringing these different groups together and having it as a shared space what is one of the biggest challenges that you've encountered yeah I guess what we say is that we're um yeah so the the history of the farm is that it was a green roof and it was being maintained by facilities and they invited the student initiated garden group to convert the space um as of because the 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 when the students said, hey, we want to grow some food, they approached Garth at yep. facilities and he was like, they were like, can we have some space? And he was like, oh, I've, I've got some space. So he, <laughs> he was like, you want this space? So he, he gave, he was like, yeah, there's, there was a few sites at the ground level that were beside dumpsters okay. that were overrun with rats and um, just everything you can imagine, like mm -hmm. um, clothing, uh, used needles, um, Oof. ravioli just the most random things um and uh <laughs> ravioli right i was like who would throw away ravioli <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah all kinds of, the gardens were being used in all kinds of different ways and um and really challenging sites like some of them were north facing so they were shady some some of the biggest challenge was just that it was near the dumpster and um so there was a lot of rats and stuff happening but, but the students showed, like they converted the space and they stewarded the space. They, they, brought, they brought new life and new energy and beauty and, and that relationship grew. So it was a symbiotic relationship between facilities who were struggling to maintain these spaces and the students who were looking for space. And facilities, Garth said, hey, do you wanna convert this roof? So Garth is sort of the champion behind why we have a, a garden on the roof of Ryerson University. And, um, and, and then the, also these students, Catherine Lung, um, Cindy Pham, and Stephanie Nishi, who, who really showed that they were passionate and that they wanted to take care of these spaces. So, um, so that was how the roof ended up being converted. And it, uh, it was it, like, in a way, we're sort of still in the pilot phase because, we're st because we got those, all the safety infrastructure, which has taken a few years. So it kind of feels we're, like we're, the beginning was a trial to see what what how does this fit on on campus where does it live institutionally how do we engage our stakeholders like brian and um as brian mentioned like yeah you have to think about all your stakeholders and and so that's that almost feels like that's the next phase and um now that we've got the state now that we sort of proven that yeah farming is something we want to do on campus and now what do we need what does it take to actually pull it off um but the other thing is yeah we say that our mission is to build capacity for rooftop farming through production research education. And uh, so I guess it can be difficult to integrate production and research and engagement all into one farm. So I guess that that can be challenging, but I feel like I, I made the answer too long and I just I should stop now. It was so. a great answer. <laughs> 
Um, well, thank you all. I'm mindful of time. It's two minutes to three. So I want to thank everyone who joined us for today's session, but really a big thank you, especially to our speakers, Isaac, Arlene, Brian. We are so grateful for you sharing your time and expertise with us this afternoon. Um, it's been truly eye-opening and very exciting um, to see what is potentially to come in the Ted Rogers courtyard. Um, that's my little, my little gardener self is very excited with all the things that I've just learned from this session. Um, so thank you all again for being here. I'd like to invite you also all to next week's panel on food sovereignty with panelist Joel Ringette, owner of Nishtish, and the Ted Rogers School chef Tommy McHugh for a conversation about practice about the practice of growing traditional indigenous foods and how we can enrich our understanding of food sovereignty. Again, thank you all for being here today and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you very Can't much. Can't wait to keep, keep the conversation going. Totally. <laughs> wherever it picks up again and whenever. <laughs> this is awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome.